Bienvenidos. Um, I'm Donna Kirscher, Professor of Spanish and Film here at Assumption. And I'd like to, I'm so happy to see all of you here, and I think you're going to have a great evening. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to mention that this event has multiple sponsors. Uh, Latin American Studies, uh, which is directed by Esteban Lustano, Women's Studies, directed by Gina Edmonds, and uh, Modern and Classical Languages and Cultures, directed by Arlene Guerrero Guadanave. Um, and we're expecting a statement. That's why we're kind of, <laughs> we were, I was delaying a little bit because these, uh, they are coming. Um, I'd like to remind you all that all of these programs have possibilities to both major and minor, um, as, as well as there is a minor in women's studies. You know? Well, I'm so delighted tonight, so excited, uh, because I get to introduce to you mi amiga and mentor, someone who's been very dear to me and very influential in my life, uh, Alicia Borinsky, Professor of Latin American and Comparative Literature at Boston University, who will be reading from her latest book of poetry, Frivolous Women and Other Sinners, Frivolas y Pecadoras. What a great, appropriate title. <laughs> At a Catholic school, we can definitely talk about what sin is. <laughs> well, seriously now, Alicia is a distinguished professor at Boston University with an impressive CV, which I can only highlight here tonight. Among her major national and international awards or recognitions are in 2001, she received a Guggenheim Fellowship she received the Latino Literary Prize for Fiction in 1996. In the year 2000, she was a judge for the selection of the International Impact Literary Prize in Dublin. Well, probably one of her most significant and long-lasting accomplishments, from my point of view anyhow, among many, is that she founded the Writing in the Americas program at BU, which our chair of our department did also uh, Good. Okay. Uh, glad for everyone to uh, to join us. Uh, speaking about the, the writing in the Americas program, which we, which, which I mean, Guerrero Watanabe uh, also took part in. Uh, this was founded with a major grant from the Mellon Foundation, and she's only recently stepped down from directing it this year. And writing in the Americas brings together and has brought together American students and Latin American writers, filmmakers, and journalists for a series of lectures, summer institutes, and workshops in Boston. And in 2007, she expanded the program to include a summer study abroad program for American students in the very cosmopolitan city of Buenos Aires. And some of you here in the audience might be interested in something like this. Well, Alicia is a prolific author since the 1970s. According to a brief library search at the University of Massachusetts, there were at least 25 books, novels, poetry, and literary criticism. And if I look at the literary criticism, I have a list of Ver y Ser Visto, Notas para una Analítica Poética, Texto, Contexto en la Literatura Iberoamericana, Incercicios, Lecturas Críticas de Obras Hispánicas, Theoretical Fables, The Pedagogical Dream in Contemporary Latin American Fiction, and one way tickets writers and the culture of exile. And of course, as you see, she's written both in English and Spanish. In literature, and I'm going to mix the novels and the poetry because I think her novels are poetic as well as her poetry has much of a sense of narrative in it. Um, with many of which she's published in English as well as in Spanish. Uh, in English, working <coughs> with the translator Cola Franson. Her first book was La Ventriloqua y otras canciones. Luego, Sueños del Seductor Abandonado, Novela Vodevil, published in English as Dreams of the Abandoned Seducer. Mujeres Tímidas y Labinos de China, Mina Cruel, published in English as Mean Woman. Timorous Woman, La Pareja Descontable, Cine Continuado in English All Night Movie. La Mujer de Mi Marido, The Collapsible Couple, Las Ciudades Perdidas para el Paraíso. And her most recent novel was Golpes Bajos, published in English as Low Blows. Well, among her scholarly achievements, Alicia discovered and promoted the figure of Macedonio Fernandez, 
Borges's master, first in her own dissertation at the University of Pittsburgh on humor in Macedonia Fernandez. Across her career, she has consistently explored the intersection between literary theory, cultural, and gender studies in numerous works about poetry, Latino writers, Latin American writers, and world literature. It would not go too far to say that Alicia considers Jorge Luis Borges to be her teacher or mentor, and the considerations of his work, for example, ficciones, continue to inform both her own writing and her teaching. I noticed that this past spring she taught a course called The Invention of Truth, a seminar that, quote, addresses contemporary strategies for representing truth in literature and film through the examination of key <coughs> concepts, dreams versus wakefulness, original authorship versus plagiarism, tendentious representations of history versus testimony, documentaries versus fictional films. And the course begins with the key uh, Borges stories, such as the circular ruins and Pierre Menard, author of Don Quixote. Well, this just gives you a little sense of the critical philosophical question she continues to address. Alicia's work has helped frame the discussion of the so-called boom generation of Latin American writers. In the 70s and 80s, Latin American literature, Cortázar, Donoso, Robastos, García Márquez, Porres, Puig, Vargas Llosa, Rulfo Fuentes, Latin American literature was discovered worldwide, but especially in Europe and the US. Um, when I was in graduate school at Johns Hopkins, Alicia invited some authors to come to speak. I distinctly remember when the Argentinian author Manuel Puig came. Puig was writing his novel at that time, Mujer del Beso Araña, Kiss of the Spider Woman, which you may know better as a Broadway show or a film. But no one knew he was doing that at that very moment. While well, standing around at the buffet table at Alicia's apartment after Puig's talk at the college, he turned to Alicia and said, she was his mujer araña, <laughs> spider woman. I tell this anecdote as a witness to how important Latin American authors have seen Alicia as an inspiration. Well, this introduction, as you can well gather, is very personal for me. Oh. <laughs> For Alicia is part of a love story. <laughs> With my future husband who's here tonight. I need the, the glass of water. <laughs> well, anyhow, I followed Alicia to study in Buenos Aires during graduate school, not because I love Latin American literature and criticism. We all go through those, those periods, you know? Uh, but because I couldn't bear not following the people I cared most for. Since the university was closed, the city under a state of siege at the start of the Dirty War, this was not the most logical time for seminars in her apartment in Buenos Aires. But that time abroad changed my life and had lasting effects. I'd like to close and cede the stage to Alicia, of course, with another anecdote about tape lasting effects and a wish for you here today. Um, over Thanksgiving, I was recently in San Sebastián, Spain, where I presented a paper on the movies of Alex de la Iglesia in Spanish. And afterwards, I was walking down the street to the city center with a Basque professor who had been in the audience, and he was, we were talking about all kinds of arbitrary things. He paused to ask me if I'd lived in Argentina, because he detected a slight Argentinian accent in the way I read my paper. <laughs> <coughs> Now, I do speak Latin American Spanish generally, not Castilian. Uh, yet, I have very rarely returned to Buenos Aires in now over a number of decades. <laughs> um, and my Spanish-speaking friends now are not Argentinian either. My husband grew up in Panama, and Alicia and I have barely seen each other. But I can still hear Alicia's voice and cadence in my mind when I read Spanish. And it must come to the surface and be heard by others from time to time, as, I, as it did in Spain. Well, my hope for you here today is that you'll fall under her spell, too, and that you'll continue to hear her distinctive voice after you leave here today. Thank you. Well, um, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Assumption College and all the many sponsors that Donna has been able to infuse with her love <laughs> and enthusiasm for my work. 
among the many gifts that poetry and literature um, has given me um, is uh, the friendship uh, of Donna Kircher and Norman uh, Holland, uh, two brilliant people totally dedicated to the life of the mind and to art. So I am very grateful uh, to Donna in particular for having triggered uh, <laughs> this wonderful evening. Um, thanks to all of you uh, to uh, respond to the call of poetry. So I shall be reading today and walking around a little bit from a book from my most recent uh, well, Can you all hear me? <laughs> yes from uh, my most recent uh, volume of poetry, which is a bilingual book, uh, Frivolous Women and Other Sinners. And I would like to read uh, both um, in English and in Spanish. This is not really a translated book. Uh, I have had the good fortune of working with Cola Franzen a, a translator and collaborator of mine. And we have, over the course of the years, changed our collaboration uh, to mean different things. So uh, this book in particular has versions in English and in Spanish that we've worked on together. And it is not truly a translation. So those of you who understand uh, both languages uh, might be amused. Uh, not to find <laughs> what you heard in one, in the other. Uh, so that's the way language <coughs> works. Uh, as Donna very well pointed out, uh, there is um, not much of a difference uh, between uh, poetry and narrative in my work. I've always been very drawn uh, to stories, but also to characters. So uh, you shall see that, at least in what I will read to you today, uh, there will be scenes, uh, there will be images. And, and that's, um, after that, I have been always very interested <coughs> in women. Because society, uh, in not having provided a very clear role for us in contemporary times, has suggested many. And it is incessantly sending messages, very dangerous messages, of makeovers. Uh, <laughs> you don't like the way your body is? Well, 10 pounds in 15 days, <laughs> off or on. You don't like this color this season? Well, change it all. Next season is going to be a different thing. So we are fragile. We are style. And society tells us that uh, in playing with us, uh, there are some interstices in which we can find our own roles. But what is incredibly interesting to me is to think of women and to think of men as they come together in this role playing. And frivolous women and other sinners is in that thing that a poet, Vicente Huidogro, called La linea mortal, the mortal, the fatal line. And he also talked of poetry as a flower of contradictions dancing the foxtrot. So we shall start, and of course, I am humbled by these um, references that I have. Uh, not that this is going to be uh, at their level, but we'll try. So um, there has been, as you know, a crisis, a monetary crisis in Argentina in the year 2001, where money lost <laughs> its value. And suddenly, society found itself as uh, it, it always is, but more barely, as fantastic literature. So once the, the confidence in the currency came back, in quick order, suddenly nobody had changed. Nobody knew what has happened to the coins, and still people don't know now. So I was um, very intrigued by that, and by a phrase <coughs> that people 
used to say all the time, and they still do, which is, tiene vuelto, go change. Hmm. So I took it a little bit literally, and here is this poem. I'll read it first in English, and then in Spanish. Go change. <laughs> Our love left me with heartburn, an acidic cringe <coughs> that repeats on me, but not in the stomach. It's in my memory, darling, in my memory. Take away the street in which we met, Give me back my appetite and the rest. So free. Tiene vuelto. De nuestro amor me quedó algo ácido. Un dejo que me repite. Pero no en el estómago, es en la memoria, querido. En la memoria. Llévate la calle en que te conocí. Devolveme las ganas y el resto, todo para vos. Truncated love, pose number one. You lost your voice. Why stop singing just when I started paying attention? <laughs> Amor fallido, pose número uno. Se te fue la voz. ¿Para qué dejar de cantar justo cuando empezaba a prestarte atención? Amor fallido, número dos. Aquí, son truncated love, Pose number two. Once upon a time, there was a couple here that fought all the time. <coughs> when he wanted candy, she heard, take off your candy. When she asked for massages, caresses, lucky lottery numbers, he took her to cabalistic centers where four men played dominoes, night and day. All the time they fought with words, with gestures and clicky tongues. All the time they smell, touch, and reject one another. But as we all know, happiness doesn't last. <laughs> Their children called lawyers, psychiatrists, social workers. Yesterday, when I saw them, they were smiling calmly in the small cafeteria, a shopping bag each, side by side, credit cards in their own names, little heads clouded by perfect pills, well within their budget and yours. Amor fallido, pose número dos. Aquí había una vez una pareja que se peleaba todo el tiempo. Cuando él quería un bombón, ella le oía, sacate la bombacha. Cuando ella le pedía masajes, caricias, números para jugar la quiniela, él la llevaba a locales cabalísticos donde cuatro hombres juegan al dominó día y noche. Todo el tiempo discutían con palabras, gestos y chasquidos de lengua. Todo el tiempo se husmeaban, tocaban y rechazaban. Pero como ya se sabe, la felicidad tuvo que acabar. Los hijos llamaron abogados, psiquiatras, trabajadores sociales. Ayer, cuando los vi, se sonreían serenamente en el café del shopping. Cada uno con la bolsita de compras en la mano, tarjeta de crédito a su nombre, cabecita obnubilada por píldoras perfectas al alcance de su presupuesto y del tuyo. Well, one of the things that is difficult for women to figure out is how to leave a legacy. <coughs> think about history, you think about families. What happens is that the name is passed through the males. And uh, women uh, generally have 
very parenthetical thoughts about their legacy. So why, one asks. Always in a hurry. Her wild nature makes her forgetful. Her breath smells of white chocolate, a vague whiff of unfilled cigarettes. She dresses in light beige. In summer, she looks naked. Was a distraction, friends. Didn't know she was dying. <coughs> Didn't manage to say goodbye. Tell us. This one gets the glove. The other one, the copper tweezers. Vida curada. Su desenfreno le provoca olvidos. Tiene un aliento a chocolate blanco. Un vago tufo a cigarrillos sin filtro. Se viste de ocre. En el verano parece desnuda. Fue una distracción, amigo. No supo que se estaba muriendo. No atinó a despedirse, decirnos, este se lleva el guante, aquel otro las pinzas de cobre. So, um, luck. She made a dive for the newspapers, hummed a few bars in Italian, swallowed all the S's, and just before taking the fatal leap, discovered she won the sweepstakes. Suerte. Se precipitó sobre el periódico, canturrió algo en italiano, se comió todas las ceses, Y antes de dar el salto mortal, advirtió que había ganado la lotería. So this is very green, no? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's all triggered uh, by language. It's all triggered by what happens to us uh, when we start playing with these jokes that language does to us and with the great freedom that irony gives us uh, to turn it all around and turn it backwards. So what happens to me sometimes is that there are writers um, who are uh, still talking to me, whose voices uh, I still hear, uh, perhaps not having ever met them, voices I have made for them in that kind of internal dialogue that one makes when one is alone, because the beauty of writing is that we are alone. The beauty of writing is that we are alone in our heads. And I see, I am so happy to see that there are so many young people with paper and pen <laughs> open. I assume that you are reading, and it is a great thing that you read and, and you write and you are alone. So I have a series of poems that are really like writing notes that I uh, dedicate uh, to some of those who talk to me. And they are not always filled with admiration. I don't think that it is here, but I have a very mean poem that I dedicate to Garcia Lorca. And I couldn't find, I was going to give it to you. So it's not all like I am writing on my knees and praising the great minds. But in this case, uh, perhaps, um, this poem has a title of a book by the writer Julio Cortázar, who was the writer for whom Julio Silva did the, uh, it's going to make a big noise. Not so bad. Um, so, um, eh, eh, Julio Cortázar is the writer for whom Julio Silva, the, the illustrator of this book, used to work and do the diagrams of most of his books. And they wrote together a book called Silva Andia. So this uh, is called, as one of Cortázar's books, End of the Bay, for Julio Cortázar. She's too young. She's fooled us with her stories of rescued princesses. She couldn't have seen much at that age. She lies when she tells you that she was there when Sleeping Beauty woke up 
and that she herself attended Snow White's wedding. <laughs> she lied. She's a girl, full-on girl who only wants to play. I've already prepared her apple. Shiny red. I'll give it to her tomorrow with a smile, a duet, and the key to herself. So, final del juego para Julio Cortázar. Es demasiado joven. No se ha engañado con sus historias de princesas rescatadas. Poco puede haber visto a esta edad. Miente si te dice que estuvo ahí cuando se despertó la bella durmiente y que ella misma asistió al casamiento de Blancanieves. Miente. Es una niña. Es una indefensa que solo quiere jugar. Ya le he preparado su manzana, reluciente, colorada. Se la atenderé mañana con una sonrisa, con una pirueta y la llavecita de su celda. Mm. So this is all about well, inconsolable. My girlfriends have hidden for the last time. I sense they are breathing behind the curtains. The mirror is still warm from their reflections. As usual, I sit them, call out a name, say, it's time to leave. It's getting late. Let's go home. Inconsolable. Mis amigas se han escondido por última vez. Percibo su aliento detrás de las cortinas. El espejo está tan caliente de sus reflejos. Por rutina la busco. Repito algún nombre. Les digo, es hora de salir. Se hace tarde. Vamos a casa. Now, We'll jump a bit from this girlhood stuff. I'll read you some more to a point that I understand some of you have liked and would want me to read. So I am grateful for uh, your reading. And I hope that my own voice does not interfere with your interpretation of what was there. Maybe we'll talk about it. Photograph of the perfect couple. Each day, they walk closer to one another. On every corner, their steps became more alike. One voice or the other would remind them of past imaginations, separatist excesses. We would terror they link their hands. What desperation company their complicities. We know they fought for that intimacy. We anticipate their fears, their withdrawal from strangers. We admire the fervor of their silences. They created a third shared sex. Their voluptuousness selves, their voluptuous selves exclude us, mock us, turn photographers, spy, as I speak to you. My friend invents you. I threaten you with yours, the language to exhaust you. Fotografía del matrimonio perfecto. Caminaron cada vez más cerca uno del otro. En cada esquina sus pasos se volvieron más parejos. Una que otra voz les recordaba imaginaciones pasadas excesos separatistas, con cuánto terror unían las manos, qué desesperación acompañaba sus complicidades. Sabemos que lucharon por esa intimidad. Anticipamos sus miedos, su desligarse de extranjeros, admiramos el fervor de sus silencios. Crearon un tercer sexo, 
compartido. Sus voluptuosidades nos excluyen, nos ironizan, me vuelven fotógrafa, espía. Al hablarte, mi marco te inventa. Amenazo nuevos idiomas, una lengua para mi ser. So somebody is calling about this point. No doubt, at the cup, part of the couple that wants to know where this ideal person is. So another, another uh, fairy tale. After dinner story, Cinderella lives in the house next door. Tonight, she's out in my place. They'll return before midnight. The kiss will be long and timid, brought up, perhaps trembling. They will promise each other things. Embarrassed to say it all, they'll hesitate before resuming their walk. And blinded by the thrill of future whispers and embraces, they won't see the golden banana peel, anxious for those feet in his shoes. <laughs> see, I can be very mean. Cuento, <laughs> in spite of my Cuento de sobremesa. Cenicienta vive en la casa de al lado. Esta noche ha salido con mi príncipe. Volverán antes de la medianoche. El beso será largo y tímido, emocionados, acaso temblando. Se prometerán cosas, tendrán vergüenza de decirlo todo, durarán antes de reanudar la caminata y absortos en el encanto de futuras caricias y cuchicheos, no verán la dorada cáscara de banana a la espera de esos pies, estos zapatos. <coughs> okay. So somebody else whom I really admire very much. He's a French writer named uh, Nathalie Sarot. Um, and I, uh, I have a, a, a misunderstanding of Nathalie Sarot because she works in, with all of these uh, chains of metaphors. I have made her out to be something that she is not but that she does too, which is something connected with fairies and wood and so on. So I have dedicated this one to Nathalie Sarot, uh, in spite of herself. <laughs> so. School for fairies. And the first line is a quotation from uh, a, a, a book by hers uh, called Fools Say. This is missing. And it's, the, the book starts that she's so sweet I could eat her up. <laughs> so she's so sweet I could eat her up. Today, I'll suggest we go together to the forest. Today, I'll dress like a school teacher so as to give her the highest grade. Tell her she's my favorite pupil. It will be today and not tomorrow because our days are overfilled with taming midgets, stepmothers, wolves, witches, and ogres that devour children abandoned by their parents. Escuela de hadas para Natalie Sarrot. Es tan dulce que me la comería. Hoy le voy a proponer que vayamos juntas al bosque. Hoy me voy a vestir de maestra para darle la mejor nota, decirle que es mi alumna preferida. Será hoy y no mañana porque tenemos los días ocupadísimos adiestrando enanos, madrastras, lobos, brujas y ogros que devoran a niños abandonados por sus padres. So it is time to openly talk about poetry. Um, you know, I was surprised yesterday when I was hearing on TV the results of the, the elections 
the Republican elections, and they referred to one of them as being a beauty contest. And I said, wow, our, our ghosts, the ghosts of women and beauty contests have entered you know, the political culture already because it was a beauty contest because it means nothing. Now that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So I held my own beauty contest about poetry. <laughs> And I have always been a bit upset at the connection, as you can see already, between poetry and only beauty. So I decided to give you one of my many poetry manifestos. And this one is called Miss Poetry. She rides around on a motorcycle dressed like a vamp, smokes cigarettes smelling of oregano in an ivory holder, has four respectful sweethearts, two cute lap dogs, and a trained butterfly for special holidays. Miss Poesia. Anda en motocicleta vestida de vampiresa. Fuma en boquilla unos cigarrillos con tufo a orégano. Tiene cuatro novios respetuosos, dos perritos falderos, y una mariposa amaestrada para los días pasados. So, something brother. History lesson. Before us, women, men. Before men, nobody. <laughs> Lección de historia. Antes que nosotras, ellos. Antes de ellos, nadie. Why does she read and write? Everybody has told her that nothing is free. But she keeps asking for loans. You know she's in debt. They are aware she's crafty. Admire her bare-faced manner, this gesture in the storm. ¿Por qué lee y escribe? El coro le ha dicho que nada es gratis. Pero ella sigue pidiendo prestado. Ustedes saben, está en deuda. La reconocen por tramposa admiran su desvergüenza este gesto en la tormenta ok, so we'll, uh, we'll talk about mothers mm, I shall pick a couple more very short texts and then we can talk uh, we'll talk about mothers we all know that mothers we do, we do anything for our kids so non-mathematical problem. The little girl chases the butterfly. The net has large symmetrical round holes. The butterfly square wings. We'd like to know how much the mother has given the butterfly. So it enters the net and bravely lets one wing be pierced and now the other. Problema no mathematical. La nena persigue a la mariposa. Esta red tiene agujeros redondos, simétricos, grandes. La mariposa, a las cuadradas. Queremos saber cuánto le ha dado su madre a la mariposa para que entre en la red y valientemente se deje pinchar un ala y ahora la otra. So I thought that maybe to, to end for now, I would read you um, some new work. So I'll, need, I'll read you a, a very short poem. This translation is my own version. The title of the poem is Suicide Threat Uttered in a Moment of Lucid Confusion by a Neighbor's Aunt Who Should Better Worry About That Beautiful Kid of Hers, Nose Always Dripping Allegedly Because of Allergies, But Who Believes Her. <laughs> it's about it. I love you. I love you, hope, body, and soul. If you were not with me tomorrow, everything would be the same as yesterday. <laughs> Amenaza de suicidio proferida en un momento de lúcida confusión por la tía de una vecina que tendría que preocuparse más por su pobre criatura llena de mocos que dice que son de una alergia, pero a mí no me compre. <risa> Te amo con todas mis esperanzas Y si no estuvieras conmigo mañana 
Todo sería igual que ayer. Ok, so if you'd like, we can talk now. for your lovely poetry in very compact and economical language, very fresh images. It's really delightful. Thank you. Um, and what I find especially interesting as well, and I hope you might speak a little bit more about your composition of poems in two languages. And partly, I think that's a very interesting thing. I mean, do, you, do you conceive of a poem in one language or another? Are there certain scenes? Normally, as a poet, you think of a person juxtaposing different concepts against each other and get, getting something beautiful or something unexpected out of the friction of those two concepts. But yes. when you're dealing in different languages entirely, it seems that that provides really interesting possibilities in its own right. And so do you think of a poem or a situation or a scene or a scenario first in one language and then <coughs> it develops in that language? or is is it uh, a kind of mutual com uh, concept? I mean, you don't write macaronic. You're not writing half English, half Spanish. No. Mm -hmm. They're, they're okay. entirely in one or <laughs> <laughs> But how, how does that, uh, the dissonance and the friction of the different languages, how does that add to your uh, art as a poet? Yes. Well, thank you for, for your comments, and thank you for listening so well. And, and this is a crucial question for me. I learned English as a little girl. Um, from age five, I started reading. It doesn't sound like it when you hear me speak, but it's true. <laughs> and so, so uh, what happened is that very soon my world, the world of my imagination, was filled with people like Lewis Carroll, for example. And so, um, when I write in, in Spanish, and, and whenever I produce my own versions, and, and you, you have just listened to one that was wholly my own. Um, it's not so much that I am thinking of translation, but I'm thinking about two individual things that uh, talk about um, the interstices that separate one experience from the <coughs> other. So the poems and, and also the, the, the texts that compose um, low blows, which are shorter texts, are in fact quite different from one another. And I've been puzzled about this. I've been puzzled about this experience and about what does it mean? Um, what is one's native language? What is one's original language? And I've come to the conclusion that my original language is translation. That is that I, I, that my language is that negotiation of experience uh, that is quite different. And I, I, I thought, um, it's a thought that has accompanied me uh, throughout um, my reading and throughout my writing. That is between English and Spanish. It doesn't happen to me with other languages. I could not do this with other languages, although my French is real. But, but I, I couldn't do it with other languages. And I have just, uh, my most recent book that, uh, that Donna uh, mentioned is in English. It's called One Way Tickets, Writers and the Culture of Exile. So I attempt to talk there about the about the the, the, the the fictions of authenticity that one builds in uh, writing <coughs> in places where your own the language that you write in is not spoken, and I arrive to some odd thoughts about it. Uh, so I am afraid I'm not answering your question, but essentially. Your question, unfolding your question, has been something that has accompanied me for a long time. So I don't have a real answer to this, uh, but there are certain um, vignettes. For example, I try, when I do the English version, I try for it to be English. Not, I avoid Latinates, I, I, avoid, I avoid that, that echo of one language in the other. And one of the chapters in my book is devoted to Bashevis Singer, who thought he wrote in Yiddish, and he thought that nobody would read him in Yiddish because the population had been killed by the Nazis. So he wanted the English to sound foreign, as though it were Yiddish. Now, I 
don't like that. I don't, uh, fortunately, uh, the Spanish speakers are alive and kicking, so, uh, so uh, I, I don't need that, I, but I don't particularly like that. And uh, um, I have recently been uh, doing some kind of exercises in mixing the languages, but uh, what they are is that they are exercises and they are almost like pirouettes where I can kind of laugh at the friction that is created on the page by doing that. So it's, it's, the, it's a great subject to just write about. Any points that you want to be doing to yourself? Yes? Why did you start writing and why? Like, what inspired you? Yes. I had a grandfather who uh, blindly believed in me. Uh, and he. Um, he was very proud of his family. He he was um, he was Polish. He had emigrated to Argentina, and he had lost part of his family in the Holocaust. So uh, for him, it was very important to continue what he thought was the line of thought to keep it alive. And somehow, since I was a very little child, even before I learned how to read and write, he instilled in me that I was a writer and that my task would be to write his biography. So he would <laughs> not <laughs> of course, I mean, he was not all generous towards oh, yes. The idea was I would become a writer to write his life, which was great. So and he really, um, he, he did that. And so I never doubted that the words were there to be written, to be combined, to be played with. I even like calligraphy. And so I would, I would just write with calligraphy. And uh, of course, at the beginning when you write, um, it's terrible because as many people, I confuse poetry with rhyme. So I used to, I used to rhyme, I used to write sonnets, things like that, but <laughs> so <yeah. laughs> but that, that was who, I mean, it was somebody who just believed that he needed a grandchild to write his story, <laughs> and he had. Yeah. Well, I actually have the same question, and I think it's uh, very interesting. One of my kids was, has been writing poetry since she could, before she could, almost before, before she could read or write, and she used to stomp around the house. And say, yes, I have to say a poem, you know. Right. And, and uh, that's why I was getting a sense that maybe that was. Well, oh, that that's interesting. So she she went around the house asking for it for a public. Yes, I was desperate that way too as a child. That it was not enough uh, to have written it, but I would go around with this paper looking for people to listen to it. And that's when my grandfather came in very handy because he knew sp very little Spanish, but nevertheless, what he knew was that he had to admire his grandchild. So huh, there I got the good stuff. So you speak Polish as well? No, never. No, I, I don't know any Polish. Um, those people, uh, you have to see that the Jews who came to Argentina that way were people who were very pessimistic about the culture that had uh, expelled them from Europe. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to, uh, to have new lives. So um, my mother, for example, who came from Poland, uh, never spoke Polish, her Spanish was excellent. Uh, and um, she made a point of speaking only Spanish in the house. And my grandfather spoke a mix of Yiddish, uh, Russian, German, you know, and, and I understood it all at that time. <laughs> Can't say, I think I understood him more than the languages. I have asked my students to prepare some, to read some of your poems and also to prepare some questions. And some of them are here, but they're not <laughs> wanting to, to so. ask the questions. But some sent to me the questions so I could ask for them. <laughs> 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 uh, because they couldn't be here tonight. Uh, 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 unfortunately uh, for them, yeah, I think they missed, they missed it out. 
But uh, one of the questions is about the one of the points that you read. So yeah, it was something about what was the inspira what was your inspiration for the history lesson? Ah, yes. Point. So that was the question. <laughs> well, uh, the, the the history lesson. Um, one of the interesting things that I tell my students is that Spanish is not gender blind. That is, uh, you go crazy correcting the Spanish when he, when they make all of these gender things. But I think that that is about it. I think that when you start talking about history, mm -hmm. what, there is one gender that organizes history. And so um, it just came to me uh, in a very neat way, that poem. And that poem on the page, if, if you look at it on the page, mm -hmm. it can be combined in different ways. So it doesn't say only one thing. And um, it is a funny kind of manifesto. See, I, I don't like speaking from the voice of authority. And I thought that it would be a good idea to give the title history lesson to something that played with language and still managed to speak a truth about oppression. And we get almost no press in history. Or, yes, um, or, or else we get press as, you know, the women behind the men or the mean women. I saw a program on TV uh, yesterday about bad girls and so, you know, it's always very interesting to see the women who, who are bad, the women who uh, go over the line, but I, I think that the great dealers are just left in the corner where they can't be anywhere. <laughs> so that was in a way. Yes. Hola. Um, Buenas noches. Me siento más cómoda hablando en español. Sí, cómo no, cómo no. Ah, uh, una pregunta. Yo escribo poemas y canciones desde muy pequeño. Y algunas veces siento que los poemas que escribo no son tan profundos como yo quisiera que fueran. Y siento como que en ocasiones cuando los, los entrego para que otra persona lo lea, como yo quiero que ellos puedan sentir lo que yo estoy tratando de transmitir cuando los escribo y de alguna manera me siento como que no lo estoy logrando. Claro. Entonces, no sé. y, sí. y mira, es así, es terrible. Uno nunca puede ser autoritario con, eh, con lo que uno escribe. No podés decir, en este momento quiero que te conmuevas. Eh, no, no pasa así, no pasa así. O sea, uno quisiera decir, yo quiero que me admires, que me conmuevas, que veas... No. Eh, la cosa es que una vez que te expones, estás ahí, junto con todas las otras cosas del universo. Ahora, yo te diría una cosa que, que sí es importante, ¿no? por lo menos en mi experiencia. Uno, antes de publicar, está como muy desnudo. O sea, lo que le das a la gente, lo que la gente te dice sobre eso, si no está publicado, te, te, te llega demasiado fuerte. O sea, te afecta. Si está en un libro, si lo tenés en un libro, es otra cosa. Entonces son dos cosas. Una, elegí bien la gente a quien se lo das. No se lo des a todo el mundo. No elijas gente que te puede herir. O sea, elegí a gente que por ahí te dice que es muy malo, que no le pasa nada, que es como ir pasar un tren, pero que no, a vos no te importa. No, no elijas la persona fundamental. Y la otra es que no publiques demasiado pronto. Porque si a la gente le gusta demasiado lo que escribí, vas a quedarte encerrada en un solo género. Es eso, no sé. Alicia 
Yes, yeah, uh, you want to give your own okay. answer. No, I don't say I won't answer for right. at least. I said that one cannot be the authority on what one writes. But once it's out, it's out. And um, I said that when one when one uh, is unpublished, um, one has to choose very carefully whom you give your stuff to because one is very naked and you can be very hurt. Uh, so um, because people are indifferent uh, or, or they barely like what you do. Um, the other the other advice is to not to publish too soon because if you are liked too much, then you are you lock yourself into a certain uh, gesture and you cannot change. So just keep it <laughs> and keep doing it. We would like to give a, uh, before I'd also like to mention that uh, Alicia Burns' book is, is for sale. It's $28, and there's she from uh, the bookstore here, and she would be very glad to uh, to sign it if you'd like to. And if uh, you have any other questions you'd like to ask her personally, I'm sure she might stay a little bit. Yes, so I also would like to give her a wonderful applause for. Uh,